It would be handy if you could keep Exodus 33 and 34 open in your Bible um, as we explore it in a bit more depth this evening. So I wonder if you've ever tried to be something that you're not. I know it's a very broad question, but just think about it for a minute. Um, Have any of you ever been in a play or been an actor or an actress or something, maybe for a short time? You know, you go in there, you learn your lines, you play your part, and you may be convincing, but if somebody comes and asks to you, well, what's your character's favorite color? Where, where were they born? What was their best friend at school's name? It just all falls apart, because that's not what you know about them. All you know is the lines that you've learned about that character. Maybe you've tried to pretend to be older or younger than you are. You know, I know some women who have been 31 for about 40 years, um, none of them are here, I hasten to add. <laughs> you know, maybe, um, maybe you try to be older, maybe you're wanting to go and see a movie that's maybe it's an 18 rated, but you're only 16, so you try and maybe you don't shave and all of the fluffy bits come out and, you know, you try and make yourself look older, maybe you dress a bit smarter, you know. Maybe you've had a little bit too much wine with your lunch, you know, you may be a bit tipsy, maybe even a little bit drunk, and maybe you're trying, you know, you ha- you're going somewhere and you're, you're trying, you pretend to be completely stone cold sober. Well, it's not going to work, is it? You're not going to fool anybody, because remember kids, adults always know. They might pretend that they don't, but they do. They always, always know. It doesn't really take much for the facade to fall away and for the truth to be exposed when you are pretending to be something that you're not. Lies will only take you so far, and you'll find that a lie will build upon a lie and a lie and a lie, and eventually they'll all just fall away, and the truth will be out there for all to see. You see this with people all the time. You see it when uh, people are trying to be really, really religious. Human beings have this tendency to try and be religious about everything. They try and come up with ideas or ways of making themselves seem more important, making themselves seem more pious, making themselves be holy. It's like, how can I be holy? You see this today in some segments of the church, but it's not new. It's been around for thousands of years. They come up with lists of things not to do if you want to be holy, if you want to be pure. So you don't drink ever, don't smoke, don't swear, don't go shopping on a Sunday, don't dress a certain way, don't listen to certain music, don't watch certain movies, don't fraternize with certain people, and so on, and so on. All you need to do is focus on the law of God. I read one quote this week, which I'm not going to read to you in its fullest because it was a bit wrong, but its emphasis was that if you drop everything in your lives, that you, all these things, and if you just focus on obeying the law of God, then you will be made holy. You will be made pure. Basically, he's just a modern-day Pharisee. Now, not that all this list is wrong in itself, but the idea that simply by avoiding these things can make you holy is very wrong. Again, this isn't a new idea. The idea of linking your your holiness, your purity to your actions isn't a new concept. You simply have to read the Gospels to see this. When you read about who was the largest opponents to Jesus' ministry, you remember that it was the Pharisees. The Pharisees were an important political and religious faction in first century Palestine, and they were considered to be holy men, men who dedicated their lives to following every word of God's law in their pursuit of holiness. They were, they were very harsh and very judgmental on people who weren't like them. They would call out and expose people's sins as often as they could, whilst always ignoring their own. The Pharisees were fond of calling people sinners just because they were regular people. 
just because they were normal people like you and me, just because they didn't spend every waking moment of their lives studying the law of God. They saw anyone who followed the way of the contemporary culture, who followed the customs of the day rather than focusing on the law as being sinners. The Pharisees were very, very strict. They had no room for error. In fact, the, the word Pharisee itself is derived from a Hebrew word meaning separated one. They saw themselves as being separated from everybody else because of how important they were. Nothing was more important than trying to keep the law of God in all its entirety. They believed that you could be holy by keeping your distance from anyone who wasn't, somebody maybe with slightly loose morals. So it was important for them that in order to maintain their holiness, to maintain their sanctity, to have no dealings with people they regarded as sinners. Now, we're talking about a group that existed 2,000 years ago, but a lot of these things we can see in our own world today. There are Christians who act like this, who actually believe that there is some sanctity in avoiding contact with unbelievers or people of different beliefs, even different cultures. Well, remember Jesus didn't do this. He didn't separate himself from those who were sinners or those who were unbelievers. In fact, he, met, he spent time deliberately with them. And this was one of the reasons why the Pharisees hated him. We read about Moses this evening, and Moses also did none of these things. Moses himself, after all, was a murderer and a coward. Moses became holy not because of anything he'd done, but because God was with him, because he talked with God, spent time with him, and his holiness passed on to Moses. Now, I wonder, have any of you ever tried to be the holiest you can be, to be the purest you can be, to be the nicest, most awesomest person in the world? And I wonder if you succeeded. Are you holy today? More importantly, do you see God as being holy? And what does being holy even mean? What does this word really mean? So two points for this evening's message. First being the meaning and the source of holiness. So, a bit more language lessons for you. It's only one word, I promise. So the Hebrew word for holy is kodesh and roughly translates to being apartness or set-apartness, separateness, sacredness, otherness, transcendence, and so on. These kind of themes. It is assigned to God because God is totally above all of his creation and all of his creatures, which includes us. Holy gives the idea of a kind of heaviness upon it, a big huge weight of glory. In the New Testament, okay, there's two words, I lied. In the New Testament, the word for holy is hagios. This again means set apart, revered, sacred, worthy of veneration. This word applies to God because God is these things. He is totally separate. He is sacred, transcendent. He is revered, and he is set apart from every single created thing, the entire universe, from every planet, every person, down to every microscopic atom. What else do you think, what else do we refer to as holy in our daily lives? Well, you pro most of us probably see it every day when we pick up our Bibles, because it says right there on the front, holy Bible. Why is the Bible holy? Not because it's a book. There are hundreds and thousands and millions of books that aren't holy. But why is this one in particular? Is it because it's made a certain way? Because it's a certain kind of paper? None of these things. It is holy because it is from God. What else do we call holy? Well, 
I know uh, Karen and Murder were recently away in Israel, which is sometimes known as the Holy Land. Again, why is it referred to as being holy? Is it because the land is so much better than the rest of the world? Is it there, is it there gold just lying around in the sand? Does every single crop imaginable grow there? Is the weather perfect? Can you just go there on holiday and enjoy yourselves without having to worry about anything? No. We think of it as the Holy Land because God was there. We read about God's actions in the Old Testament, about his presence in the land, and we think of it as holy. And then, of course, there's the Holy Spirit. Well, why do we think of him as holy? Well, of course, remember that he, too, is fully God, and all three persons of the Trinity are, of course, holy, and they have the weight of this glory and holiness abounding in them. The idea of holiness is so central to the teaching of Scripture that it is said of God, holy is his name. His name is holy because he is holy. Although he is a person, he is unique among persons. We don't meet him like a friend or a family member, you know, just a handshake or a hug. But we meet him on our knees in true awe of his glory. We read in Exodus 3, in the account of God speaking to Moses from the burning bush. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Again, why was that ground holy? Not because there is anything special about it, not because it's magical or it's got healing properties or there was treasure there, but simply because God was there. And Moses is told to remove his sandals in respect, and at this time he is too afraid, too frightened to look upon God. What about later on in the story of Exodus in chapter 19 when Israel meets with God at Mount Sinai? Here the whole mountain is considered to be holy ground. We read from chapter 19, verse 23. Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up Mount Sinai because you yourself warned us, put limits around the mountain and set it apart as holy. Any who violated this rule were to be put to death. And what about centuries later when Isaiah went to the temple in chapter 6, verses 1 to 5? In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, Isaiah writes, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, for I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Now, God has many attributes that are revealed to us in Scripture. We learn that He is merciful, that He is patient that he's very long-suffering, that he's abounding in love, that he is just. But the only attribute of God that is mentioned three times like this is apparently the most important attribute we are to consider about God. Not that he is just holy, but that he is holy, holy, holy. In the Jewish language, when something is considered important, it is mentioned twice. We see this quite often. Jesus does this himself when he's talking to the disciples, when he says things like, truly, truly, or verily, verily, in the old language. It is also, <clears throat> it's also used to, signif to yeah, signify great intimacy with someone. 
when you repeat somebody's name twice like this. But when something is mentioned three times in a row, its importance skyrockets. And this is why all of the, out of all the attributes of God, the fact that he is holy, holy, holy is the most important. This is the greatest emphasis that can be put on anything or anyone in Scripture. And this is telling us, again, that this is the most important thing about God. John Frame, the theologian, writes this. Holiness, then, is God's capacity and right to arouse our reverent awe and wonder. It is his uniqueness, his transcendence. It is his majesty for the holy God It's like a great king whom we dare not treat like any other person. Indeed, God's holiness impels us to worship him in his presence. Because we are sinners as well as creatures, God stands over us not only as transcendent, but as ethically pure. It is particularly as sinners that we fear to enter God's presence. When Isaiah hears the seraphs cry, holy, 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 he immediately remembers his own sin. Sadly, today, God is not always treated with the holy reverence that he deserves in our society. His name is taken and trampled through the mud everywhere you go. You can't read a book, you can't watch a television program or see a movie without hearing God's name be taken. It is, it is used as a curse word, as an expletive. The world has little respect for God's name, and this shows that they have little respect for him. There is no honor, there is no reverence, there is no awe. But when Moses asks to see, asks to see God's glory in Exodus 33, God proclaims to him his name. He is saying that if you truly grasp the importance of the name of God, then you have seen his glory and you know his holiness. God is not mucking about with Moses when Moses asks him to show me your glory. Show me your holiness, he asks. And God answers with, this is my name. The names of God are the manifestations of his glory. The name we hear in verse 19 is the name Yahweh. The same name that we heard back in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, with the burning bush. The the name Yahweh was explained as meaning, I am who I am. Here it is instead explained with the words, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. Sorry, my thing is frozen. Notice how these sentences... Although they sound different, they're both built in the same way. In Exodus 3, the focus was on the existence of God. I am who I am. That he is what he is, without anything other than himself determining his personality or his power. And in Exodus 33, the focus is on his actions and his grace. That he does what he does. Anything without anything other than himself determining his actions, his choices. This is what God reveals about himself when Moses asks to see God's glory. In verse 18 of Exodus 33, Moses pleads with God, show me your glory. And God answers him, I will make all my goodness pass before you. I will proclaim before you my name, And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. And this leads us on to our second point, which is Moses' request and the reflection of holiness. So we've heard that Moses asked God to show his glory to him. It's a very, very brazen request, really, isn't it? When we think about how he was at the burning bush, hiding his face because he was afraid to look upon God, Now he is asking to see it. He is demanding to see God's glory. No one is allowed to see the face of God. 
The Bible warns us of this here. No man can see the face of God and live. One would think that Moses had maybe already seen enough, having witnessed God's glory at the burning bush, having seen his actions through the plagues of Egypt and the parting of the Red Sea and all the other gifts and miracles God had performed. But still, he wanted more. He wanted the most ultimate spiritual experience he could have. He asked God, show me your glory, show me your face. But God refused him. I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you, the Lord says. I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. This is what the Lord does. Then the Lord said, There is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. Now this is where it gets a bit odd. For when God told Moses that he could see his back, the literal translation of the text can be translated as you can see my hindquarters or my backside. God allowed Moses to see his backside, but not his face, never his face. Now, generally speaking, in our culture, we tend to think of the, the backside of things as being the worst side, really. When you buy a piece of furniture, a bookcase or something that sits against the wall, the, the back of it is often bland, it's not decorated. The underneath is just bits of wood. There's nothing smart about it there. You don't want that bit to be seen. You want to hide it against the wall. When we, can, when we think about somebody as being a person from the backwaters, we see them as being kind of ignorant or poorly educated or not being as a, of a high standing as we are. The person who brings up the rear of a race is the loser. Generally, we try to avoid people's backsides. But here, Moses is told by God that you will see my back. Moses will see the backside of God. It sounds maybe a bit disrespectful, but that's what the text is saying. Does this suggest to us maybe that Moses got less than he asked for? Less than he hoped for? Well, maybe, but the text makes it very clear to us that even the backside of God is his good side, for it is the goodness of God which will pass before Moses. God had granted Moses' request, rather astonishingly, really, to see his glory, but not without restrictions. These are for Moses' own good. The verses that we just heard, verses 20 to 23, describe these restrictions. God must place on Moses' request along with his provision for Moses' safety and his protection while he witnesses the glory of God. Moses is asked to see the glory of God in a visible form. God speaks of the form in which he will manifest himself. It's a not, it's difficult to explain, but when God talks about showing himself in, the, in this way, it's what we call an anthropo anthropomorphism. That's another big word for you. Which is a sophisticated way of saying that God speaks of his self-revelation to Moses in man-like terms, in terms that we can understand. Because God does not really have a face. He does not really have a back. He is God. He is spirit. But in this way, he's explaining to us how he will show himself to us. God speaks of Moses being able to see his back, but not his face. But still, Moses was able to see all of God's goodness. Had God granted Moses what he'd asked for, Moses would have been struck dead by the full, unshielded un presence of the living God. It is only in heaven 
when we are rid of all sin, that we shall behold God face to face. As we read in Revelation 22, verse 4, they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Thus God granted Moses the privilege of seeing more of him than perhaps any other person had ever seen up to this point. He will see a part of God's glory, but he will not see the full extent of his holiness. He will see in human terms God's back, but not his face. There was a rock there for him on which he could stand. And while he stood upon this rock, God passed by him in all his goodness, in all his splendor. God's hand itself would shield Moses from the full radiance of God's splendor. In much the same way as a welding mask filters out the most brilliant light of the welder to stop the welder getting blinded. When God had passed by, he will take his hand away so that Moses could look upon a part of his glory, upon his back. Let us not fail to appreciate the wonder and the honor of this revelation that God gave to Moses. While it was only God's back that he saw, it was all that Moses could have survived. It was more than any man had ever yet been privileged to see. To see a little of the infinite God is to see much more than the mind can even fathom, than we can ever hope to comprehend. Moses will be dipping deeper into the bottomless well of God's infinite glory more than any man has ever dipped before. And yet, he would still have but skimmed the surface of the full splendor of God. Having spent some more time on the mountain, making the two new tablets of the law with God, Moses returned down to reunite with the people of Israel, only to discover something amazing. His face was shining. He was glowing. Moses' face was shining with the reflected glory of God. Having heard his glory, seen his glory, and spoken to him, Moses now reflected this back. God's holiness had rubbed off onto Moses. And what was the people's response? Well, they were terrified. They, sh they shied away from him in horror. Well, wouldn't you do the same? If somebody came to you and their face was shining with a, such a bright light, wouldn't you run away from them as fast as you could? The light of Moses' face was too bright for the people to look upon. Like gazing into the daylight after emerging from a dark room, they were dazzled. Worse than when the driver leaves his high beams on in the dark. So much so that Moses had to place a veil over his face just so that people could approach him. The light of the reflected glory and holiness of God upon Moses terrified the people. They knew that Moses had come so close to God that he was now reflecting their, his glory back at them. And if there's one thing that happens to men when they see the holiness of God is that they remember how unholy they are. You'll remember that Moses only saw the back of God, didn't witness the full glory of his face. And now if the reflected glory of God's back was enough to illuminate the face of Moses with such a bright light that he needed to cover his face for people to be able to even talk to him, then how could any have stood to see the face of God? Well, they couldn't. Yet this is what is promised to all Christians. What, exactly what was denied to Moses, we will be able to see God face to face. We will be able to fully bask in the fullness of his holiness, the true extent of his glory. Death often frightens us. When we see another person die, we are reminded that we are also mortal. We have heard examples of this from some recent testimonies in our church. 
we are reminded that someday death will inevitably come to us all. It's a thought that we can try to ignore, that we can push out from our minds. We become uncomfortable when another's death intrudes into our lives and reminds us all that we will face the same fate at some unknown future time. Death reminds us that we are not God, that we are simply creatures, that we are human beings, we are finite. Yet as scary as death can be, it's nothing with meeting a holy God. When we encounter him, the fullness of our nature as created beings, as mere mortals, is thrust in our faces. It shatters the myths that we built about around ourselves, the myth that we will live forever if we try hard enough. The truth comes out that one day we will die. But this is a good thing. It reminds us that we need God to be what we are not. When we understand the character of God, we begin to grasp something of his holiness that maybe we didn't understand before. Once we understand the full extent of our sin and our hopelessness, the fact that we are helpless, that we are sinners, we learn that we can survive only by God's grace. Our own strength is futile. We are spiritually incapable without the assistance of a merciful God. We may dislike giving our attention to God's wrath and justice. It may make us uncomfortable. But until we incline ourselves to these aspects of God's nature, then we cannot fully appreciate the gift that was bought for us by His grace. Even John Edwards famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, was not designed to stress upon the horrors of the flames of hell, but instead focuses upon the hands of the holy God who holds us up in his hands and rescues us from that fate. The hands of God are gracious, loving hands. They shielded Moses from the light of his glory that would have killed him. They alone have the power to rescue us from certain destruction and death. See, ultimately, being holy, having holiness has nothing to do with us. We cannot become holy on our own accord. We cannot buy it or work for it. Like Moses, we can only obtain this holiness from God. We shouldn't be terrified by this holiness anymore because with the death of Jesus Christ and the grace of God, we are now filled with such awe, with such deep gratitude. Here is a holy God, a God that transcends everything that we know, that we understand, that we fathom, giving his life for us, a bunch of sinful creatures. We remember John's vision in Revelation 4, verse 8. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Here is when John, like Isaiah, gets a vision of the heavenly, holy God. He sees a vision of Jesus Christ, his holy glory, and the angels also having six wings in the same way that Isaiah saw them. And they are continuously, day and night, never stopping, never ceasing, repeating, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. This who was and is and is to come shows us the eternity of the eternal the eternal face of Christ that he was always that he has always existed and does exist now and will always exist he is holy to the third degree holy 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 because Jesus is also God 
These creatures had the six wings for the same purpose that they did in Isaiah's vision. They flew with two, and they covered their face or eyes with the others, and they covered their feet with the remaining two. This shows us just how holy God is, that even the heavenly beings cannot look upon his face, that he is above all things, that he is truly holy. Some have theorized that this mentioning of the holy three times could maybe indicate that there is one holy for each of the person of the Trinity. I'm not fully 100% sure about this, but it's a theory. And that he is omnipotent, that he is omnipresent, that he is om, 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 omniscient, but most important, that he is holy, holy, holy. So do we need to be holy people tonight as we go home? Yes, we do. But the important thing to remember is that God does tell us that he's wanting us to make ourselves holy, that he doesn't want us to simply be holy. But as it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, but just as he who, is called, he who called you is holy, So be holy in all you do, for it is written, Be holy because I am holy. We are holy because God is holy, not because of us, not because of our actions, our deeds, whether we do certain things or not, but because we put our faith and trust in a holy God who imbibes us with this holiness. God, through Moses, tells the children of Israel that they must be holy. Be holy, he says, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. In Leviticus 19, verse 2. How can we be holy, though, even with this, because we are wicked to the core? Is this even possible? Well, if we have repented, if we have trusted in Christ, it is you of whom they speak in Revelation 7, when John, when John writes, they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And in First Peter chapter 1, with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without blemish or spot. You can be made holy, made acceptable to God. Our faces don't need to glow like Moses for us to be holy. Simply putting our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ is enough. And there is no other way. We read in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. The truth is, you will either die in your sins and be judged and found guilty and be separated from God forever, or you will be one of his servants that will worship him for all eternity. You will see his face. His name will be on your foreheads. There will be no more night. There will be no need for the lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light. And they will reign forever and ever. The source of holiness is not found here on earth. But in the heavens with our holy, glorious, loving Father. Amen.